welcome to Midweek Fill Up, where we have the hour and a half of power from on high. Hallelujah. Let's get up into worship this evening. Jesus blinded all my darkness. He sparked my heart within. His grace and mercy did a passion consume my sin. And like a city on a hilltop, I shine through the night. I am a lamp made for His glory. I will not hide. I've been touched by a fire, so let the
Come and watch me burn. Come and watch me burn. You
worship him.
All over this place with hands lifted up, hearts directed to Him. Lord, we love You. We praise You. Hallelujah. We give You glory. Father, Your will be done tonight. Your will be done tonight. Your will be done tonight on earth and in this place as it is in heaven. Thank You, Lord. As faith puts You right where, hallelujah, right in this place tonight. Hallelujah. We always know you go where our faith puts you. And so, Lord, we love you. We worship you. You be glorified in your Son tonight. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for working and moving. Hallelujah. We thank you that tonight, Father, give each person eyes to see and ears to hear. Thank you tonight that we're open, that we're receptive, and we are expecting. We give you praise and give you glory. May all glory, all praise, and all honor be to your son Jesus Christ we thank you the head of the church hallelujah we give you praise and, and give you thanks tonight that your church your people will be helped Lord will be strengthened will be further prepared for the soon return and coming of our Savior the Lord Jesus Christ and for this we give you the praise and, and we give you the glory for it all Father and Father we thank you for one another we thank you tonight for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we pray to, for them to our left and to our right. We thank you for touching each and every one, giving answers and bringing answers to questions and, and solutions to problems and the, and the help that each person needs. Thank you tonight that we're receptive and we're, we're open, we're attentive to what the Spirit of God is saying. And Father, we thank you that by being doers of the word and not hearers only, we shall be blessed and at deeds. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you for it now. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone that agreed with that said, Amen. Praise God. A great big God bless you tonight. Amen. Now, you know that we're having special meetings tonight, but before we get into that, why don't you find a couple people and love on them, greet them tonight, let them know that you're glad that they are here tonight, that they're special to God and to you. Amen. Praise God.
<laughs> Glory to God. Woo! Isn't it good to be in church on Wednesday night? Come on, I, I, know you, I know you're fellowshipping with one another, but isn't it good to be on, in church on Wednesday night? Yeah. Praise God. You know what? The truth is, here's the truth. You may not know how many more Wednesday nights we have on earth. Hallelujah. So you just will make the most of it. Praise God. And what better place to be than right here. You know, we're, we're filled to spill. Come on. We're filled to spill. Amen. Praise God. And so we're so grateful that you are here tonight. We call you blessed. I'm just reminding everyone that next week we will continue at Wednesday night services. But through the summer, what we're going to be doing special, we're going to come in right at 7 o'clock, come a little early, fellowship with one another. We're going to have an hour of prayer. Amen. Praise God together. You know, all great moves of God was preceded by prayer. Amen. But they, they just didn't. You know, start there and, and then just everybody just say, well, prayer got us there. But prayer, you know, it's not that big of a deal. No, it carries that momentum as part of God's plan and purpose. Amen. To establish His will on the earth. Amen. So we're going to come and through the, through the at least through August, we're going to be doing that. And then we'll, we'll just talk about other things that we're going to be doing on Wednesday nights. Amen. So we can come. It'll be, I can promise you it'll probably be a little different each time. So it won't be, you know, the same every time. I can just assure you that it will not be. And you say, well, what does that mean? Will you come and find out? Praise the Lord. And so it will be good. It will be good. Praise the Lord. And you have a supply to give. But talking about good, if you were not here this uh, morning, please go online and listen uh, to this morning's message from Healing Center. Amen. It was, I'm telling you, one of the, the, one of the most blessed messages concerning um, healing, but really our right for healing, what belongs to us. Understanding what belongs to us, it was, it was just wonderful. It was powerful. I believe that many people received. Man, I'm just telling you, many people came and, and they received. That's what it should be like. So tonight... Um, Brother Joe is going to come in just one moment. At the end of the service, we're going to receive our offering for him. Amen. And so just let everybody know, hang around at the end. His book and product table is in the back. If you want to get some, I know that y'all get his t-shirts and the different things that he has there, the information. But we are excited. You know, Joe, this has kind of been like, uh, I don't know, the last six, seven, eight years you've been coming. And uh, it's just, it seems like it's always at the right time. And uh, this message... Uh, the message of Christ's return, the rapture of the church, end times. I mean, I, if this last 18 months in our country, if we can't see that we are, uh, you know, right there, then, uh, you know, uh, you need another dip. Amen. Praise God. And so, but, you know, it, the reason why we need to be so accurate on this is so because it was designed to motivate us. Amen. Not to get complacent, not to get scared, but to motivate us and to be equipped so that we can touch a, a lost world. Amen. Or, and touch people and give them the truth. Amen. See the stability in your life and then want what you have. Amen. Praise God. Why don't you turn to your neighbor tonight and say, you're looking pretty good in Christ tonight. Amen. Looking pretty good in Christ tonight, brother. Amen. So let's put our hands together for Brother Joe as he comes. Today. Amen. Reverend Joe Moore, say amen. Come on, brother. Amen. We love you. We call you blessed tonight, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. I got one more button I need to do. There we go. Man, good to see you. Hallelujah. What a treat to come on Wednesday night. I'm excited that you're going to start doing those back again. And, uh, man, there's something about gathering. You know, there's something about being in the room, something about hearing the Word. It just impacts your soul. Obviously, the Word goes into our spirits, but just your, even our, our soul is so exposed to what's going on in the world. And you come in here, and you hear worship, hear about Jesus, and hear messages that, that alter us. Hallelujah. I don't know about you. I, I want to be changed into His image. Every, every service that, that when we hear the word, uh, that we're being altered into his image. Hallelujah. I like that. Praise God. So, and just as Pastor Chris said, so soon uh, we'll see him. Isn't that amazing to be that generation? That we, uh, of all the generations, uh, we get to be here at the very end. 
And man, how cool is it? Jesus said the generation that sees Israel return and Jerusalem on back, he said that group of people won't pass away till all is fulfilled. So we're pri- that's us. We're, we're privileged, very, very privileged. And I know some people, you know, that, they, that freaks them out, but uh, Jesus said heaven and earth will be altered, but you can't change these words. <laughs> so, so tag, you're it. Hallelujah. <laughs> So whether you're ready for it or not. So I, there's just a lot for us to do. And I look at your building. I look at your property. I look on the, the plans back in that room. And I just think of how, what a cool harvesting place. I believe it'll just, you'll have a season of just explosion yes. Yes. and souls being swept into the kingdom. And uh, man, you can start parking cars on the grass, parking cars. I, you just, I'm telling you, it's going to be a fun season right here before we leave. And, and so he needs everybody in position. And that's why, you know, oftentimes the preachers will get really uh, uh, bold about certain things about what we have to do. is because God's trying to warn us that there's things coming. And it's not bad things, it's good things. I mean, for, for the world, it's bad things. For the church, there's an influx of people. And I believe, I personally believe this. I could be wrong. You guys can correct me after the rapture. I believe that... <laughs> I believe that. I, I mean, I personally believe this. There'll be a period of time just before the rapture that maybe two or three weeks where you have services 24 hours a day. So you've heard the word. So Pastor Chris can go. You take the service seven to nine. You take it nine to eleven. You take it eleven to one. You take it one to three. You take it three to five. And you just got people hearing the word 24 seven. And uh, there'll be such an unction to be around the, the, the plan of God that you'll know it. You'll go, oh man, we've got to be at the church worshiping and preaching, and people will come running in. What's the deal? The King's about to come. So think about those that get born again the day before the rapture, get to, get to miss the tribulation, hallelujah. So we've gotten into a lot of information. I know it's a ton, but He loves you. He wants to bless you, wants to encourage you, doesn't want you afraid. If you, if you hear any end time preaching and it scares you, it's just not, it's not Bible. I had a couple pastors, dear friends of mine, this is what they said. They said, I was dreading having you in, Joe, but I knew I was supposed to, to hear about end times. And they said when we were done, they were lighter and happier and joyful. And isn't that something the fruit of end-time preaching should make us joyful? So uh, uh, what great things ahead. So let's get into it. I know we got into a lot the last few days, so let's, we're going to pick up where we left off. And tonight, I, I know some of you have heard it, but we're going to get into the millennial reign of Christ. And we'll get into when you see what you're going to be doing the next thousand years, it really, everything else makes sense right now. I mean, I got in this in 1970. That was was that 51 years ago? And uh, back then, there were no Word of Faith churches anywhere. My mom started a Word of Faith church because there were no Word of Faith churches. And uh, at about 72, 73, 74, a few cropped up here and there. Now, every town you go into, there's an independent, uh, full gospel, Holy Spirit church all over the country. You can spot them when you're driving in. They all have the, the cool names. You know, some of them are Last Day's Tabernacle of the Light and the Burning Fire of the, of the Last Day's Glory and, <laughs> and Outpouring. You know, they're like some of them are long names. Where you go, that's the Lord raising up churches. So, so he's done this to where we'll know his character. Yeah. Yeah. And we know his thought pattern through his word, not through feelings. And when we get into what we're going to get into tonight about the millennium, that'll make even more sense so that while I'm, maybe you're reigning in Virginia and Jesus is personally in Israel, you'll know his thoughts and his thought pattern because you've learned his, his character through his word. Yes, yes. So you'll be, a, you'll be a wonderful judge or ruler during that time. So whether, whether we're ready for it or not, you're going to have oversight over people. So uh, buckle up. You've got a lot to do during that thousand years. It is a thousand years off, but we'll get into it. We'll have functions. It's going to be fun. It's going to be so cool. And we don't hear enough preaching on it, but it'll, it'll make you happy. So grab your Bibles, and you just turn wherever you think you ought to turn. We'll see if you're flowing. Praise the Lord. Go, go to Matthew, and let's do about two minutes of review or four minutes of review if I can, as you go to Matthew 24 or 25 or 26, and we'll see where we start. I want to say this to, to Pastor Chris and Pastor Debbie. I, just, I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate your hunger for the Lord. They are so intent on doing the will of God. And I see all of your thought patterns when I come, and you're, you're so on fire to do the will of God. So what a wonderful thing said of you right before we leave that you're in position for what heaven has for you. I mean, we all know people that should be in position but are not through one thing or another. People have gotten hurt or people have gotten offended or whatever. And I understand that. But man, you shrug off everything. Don't be offended by anything. I mean, if everybody went crazy, if Brother Copeland got on TV and said, I'm a flaming cross-dresser, I'd go, well, that's too bad. I'm going to obey God. My faith, my, you know what I'm saying? I, did, I said that about hey, Brother Hagin years ago. People freaked out. I don't, so my faith, I love Brother Copeland. I love Brother Hagin. I love everybody. But my faith is not in them. My faith is in the Word. So nothing shakes me. I'm, not, I'm steadfast. Nothing moves me. So don't, don't be moved by anything. Right. If someone comes on saying, hey, the Messiah showed up in, in the middle of Kansas and we're supposed to go see him, say, no, nope, he's not there. We're going to be raptured before that happens. So there's going to be a lot of weird stuff like that coming. So don't be tricked or don't be deceived. Don't be weirded out. But the main thing is have zero fear. 
Because the last days for the church will get better and better and better and better while the world gets darker, you'll get brighter. The expression of the resurrection of Jesus in your face will be seen by so many, the glory of the Lord upon the church. It'll be awesome. Just like uh, there's some forerunner things from the Old Covenant, when that bridge was gapped between old and new, you got things that were happening, that they were doing things that were indicative of the next dispensation. You're going to be doing things indicative of the next dispensation, and we'll get into all that. So, so you're a forerunner, you're a previews generation. How many of you, when we used to go to movies, <laughs> uh, it don't seem like there's any movies anymore, but I like seeing the previews. I like seeing the previews to the Top Gun movie, you know, the, uh, the, new, uh, the new Top Gun movie. The previews are unbelievable. If, if the movie's anything like the previews, it's going to be amazing. So the previews are there to get you interested in the movie. So you are the previews to the millennial reign of Christ. Can people look at your liberty, look at your freedom, look at your joy, and go that Jesus reigns in you? Hallelujah. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for this wild bunch that came on Wednesday night, Lord. Thank you for blessing them. Thank you for everything they set their hand to will prosper. I thank you for the call of God on all their lives uh, to be voices and witnesses. I thank you for using them, divine utterance, supernatural utterance, that their, 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 their mouths would be a voice for you uh, to be used in the last days, to warn people of the coming of the Lord and great rejoicing to be at hand. And almost literally like spiritual cheerleaders, every person in this room, use them, Father. Amplify your voice through their life. We thank you for it. I thank you for directing us, guiding us. We trust in you with all of our heart. We lean out to our own understandings. All of our ways we acknowledge you and you direct our path. And your, our path way there is light and there is no darkness at all so we thank you for great days ahead we're in position for what you have for us and we thank you for it we're so excited to see you jesus so we thank you for marching orders every time we gather and we thank you for a great power of the spirit of the living god to propel us to do what we're called to do so great strength for every person in this room great boldness for every person in this room and Lord, we, we lift you up and magnify you. Help us uh, see Jesus tonight, Holy Spirit. Help us uh, get a glimpse of His glory, a glimpse of, uh, of His brightness and how wonderful He is. We thank you for your goodness, Lord, and your kindness. In Jesus' wonderful name, and everybody said amen. amen. So Sunday morning, we got into the signs of the coming of the Lord. We got into how, how we can tell by looking at all the signs. There's about 50 to 60. I'm, do, I'm doing an end times book that should be out this fall. It was going to come out last year, but we waited because Rick Ritter's book was on end times. So they said, uh, you're getting put on the back burner. I said, well, absolutely. Let's do it. Let's make sure his goes out. But there's about 60 some odd signs in there for our generation. You really can't find that anywhere in public, in pub, you know, in things that are published. There might be 10 signs here, 15 signs there. But when you get all 60 kind of in your face, it's like... Holy cow, Jesus is coming back. So, so that's what we got into Sunday morning was all those signs. Israel returned, you know, Hebrew language returned, Ethiopian Jews brought back, fertility of the land of Israel, revival of the Roman Empire, uh, the, the uh, foxes on the Temple Mount, fish showing up in the Dead Sea. I mean, think about that. Tangible things that you, you can't deny. Because Ezekiel prophesied there'd be fish in the Dead Sea. You know what? There was never been any fish in the Dead Sea. When did it show up? Last year. So in our lifetime, all these things are coming to pass, so that tells us we're, we're very close to seeing Him. So then, then Sunday night, we got into the rapture of the church. We got into, we're going to be caught up. You have so much authority, He has to take you off the earth because that seven-year period is old covenant time. It's not for us. It's time kind of Jacob's trouble, Israel's trouble, not the church. And so we talked about that. We didn't even get into how uh, when, when uh, the angels went down to Sodom and Gomorrah to get Lot out, uh, the angel told Lot, we can't do anything here until we get the righteous out. So that's exactly what happens. The righteous will be uh, literally taken off the earth, transported to heaven. That's why I told the Lord, get your uh, flux capacitor working, you know. That's, that's from the movie Back to the Future, praise the Lord. But we, we see there, there'll be a great departure. Remember the rapture of the church? The church goes up to meet the Lord in the air. At the second coming, we bodily come back down with Him. So we'll get into a little bit of that tonight. We're going to look at some of that. So how blessed are we that we're about to get a glorified body? Uh, the biggest change for all of our lives is just about to happen. Yeah. So how wonderful will that be to, uh, you know, my weight is perfect, but my height is not perfect. So I'm looking forward to getting that changed. Hallelujah. Because my weight is perfect if I was 6'3". But anyway, <laughs> want it to be great to never gain any weight again? Want it to be great to never be tired again? Think of our vocabulary is getting ready to change a lot. You know, it's just going to be wonderful. So, so wonderful things ahead. Let me just say this before we get to the millennium tonight. The rapture is not an ending, it's a beginning. 
So once we get into the millennium tonight, we'll see how we're, we're not done with what we're doing here. We're, we're right now tasting of the powers of the world to come. So we're learning all this because we're not done. Rapture is going to be fun. We're going to go to heaven, go to the reward seat of Christ, marriage supper of the Lamb. But then we're instantly coming back for a thousand years to reign with Him on the earth. So uh, we're, we're one of those people that kind of understand what's happening because we're that last generation. I mean, it's just going to be so cool to be rulers on the earth and, and blessed. So... With that, we need to start with a little bit of the second coming of the Lord. And the reason why we get into the second coming for a little bit is to show you the verses that tell us what happens at the end of the tribulation. How the natural people that make it through the end that are born again will enter into the natural kingdom for a thousand years and have kids and you'll be preaching to those kids to get saved. So the whole thousand years you think, what am I going to be doing? There's going to be a generation of people that with Jesus there, you'll be going, hey, you need to receive Him. He's sitting right there on the throne. So your job's not done at the rapture. Now, I know that will be weird, but natural people that have those kids that make it through the latter part of the trip, they're going to repopulate the entire earth, and they have to get born again. Even when they can see Him, they'll still have to get saved. Hallelujah. So we'll get into all that. So with that, we look at the second coming of the Lord. This is probably the grand event of all grand events. I mean, you've got different pictures of it in the Old Testament. Uh, Zechariah, I think, has the best ones. Zechariah 13 and 14, the most graphic, most elaborate pictures of the second coming. It talks about at the second coming, when Jesus comes back, people's eyes are melted away in their sockets, just like the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's what made that book, movie so cool, is that's exactly what's going to happen. It'll be so intense tense that people's faces melt away. I mean, Zechariah describes that. So it's going to be so amazing at the second coming that the mountains all break in pieces. Think how violent that's going to be that mountains break apart. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you what, we, 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 we sometimes don't really get it yet that God is coming back to the planet. Okay, now, the one who, this is how he spanned the heavens in his hand, the depths of the water in the palm of his hand, and all he said was, light be. And all of a sudden, the universe began to expand at the speed of light. And then all of a sudden, he made all the planets. And I'm telling you, we, we have no concept of how amazing he is. We get a little bit of a glimpse of it here and there, but we, we won't exhaust throughout eternity how amazing he is. Your eye makes more calculations in a second than all the supercomputers combined. Come on, the, 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 uh, your, your nerve cells, we were talking about that the other day, they're, they're, they're a sodium and potassium ion that go, they rotate uh, on a nerve cell. It jumps a thing called a synapse. and goes, In other words, it gets airborne and goes to the next nerve cell just so you can feel everything. He, he's amazing. He's flawless. You're, it, so it's going to be so cool to get around him. And isn't it wonderful to have your dad be motivated by kindness, goodness, mercy? He's not moody. Dad's not moody. You, Dad's not bipolar. <laughs> Want to be cool? So let's look at these. Let's look. All those other... Malachi saw him with healing in his wings. Joel said, uh, sound an alarm. Wake everybody up. The king's coming. Now this is the big deal about the second coming. The whole book of Revelation is about this one thing. He's about to be revealed as the king of kings and the lord of lords. At the first coming of the Lord, he spit upon, mocked, beaten, humiliated and pierced in His side and put on a cross, this time every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess that He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. You talk about the entrance of the King. You talk about Lucifer. The Bible says at the second coming, right there at the Battle of Armageddon, you have the armies from the east coming over from China. They go over the Euphrates River. ISIS has been damming up the Euphrates River, for like, trying to for the last five or six years. The Bible says China comes over the Euphrates River, and the kings of the east come at the Battle of Armageddon. All these countries come together to try to annihilate Israel. And you know what's going to happen? The, king, the Ancient of Days, when Daniel was talking to Gabriel, Daniel was like, man, this, is, this doesn't look good. It doesn't look like things are going to be all right. And, and Gabriel goes, don't worry. The Ancient of Days, he will prevail. And my friend, you talk about an entrance. He's going to come back at the Mount of Olives. Lucifer is going to hit his knee. And the Bible says that Jesus obliterates them with the brightness of his coming. Woo, hallelujah. You talk about an entrance. <laughs> it's going to be the coolest thing we've ever seen. And the wonderful thing about the second coming, we'll be coming back with him on white horses and we'll have a view of all the inhabitants of the earth going, what is that radiation? What is that light? It, it, his face is brighter than the sun. There's no need for the sun. Didn't say there isn't a sun. There's just no need for it because of the glory in his face. That's some radical candle power. So go to Matthew 24. Let's get into this. Here we go. Let's watch what Jesus says about this in Matthew 24. Look at verse 27. Here he's going to bring out some words that show you what it'll be like. 
Verse 27, For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So, so you, you get around lightning and it's pretty radical. When I was here maybe seven, five years ago, whatever, I was staying in that place. Uh, uh, lightning hit this tree about from me to Pastor Doug. It's probably maybe a little bit further than right there. I mean, it hit right outside the window. I was standing there looking out the window. God, bam, flash of light. The hair on the back of my head, like that. I, mean, I, I almost came off the ground, praise the Lord. <laughs> didn't scare me. It freaked me out. <laughs> I thought I was getting ready to see Jesus right then. <laughs> so, uh, so lightning's pretty, pretty dramatic. I've never seen lightning that was boring. Oh, look, a bolt of lightning, whatever. No, it's going to be radical. So let's keep going here, going down to verse 29. He says in verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they'll see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with great power and great glory. He'll send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they'll gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now this is kind of the opposite of the rapture, but what's amazing is at the second coming, at the rapture of the church, hang with me because we're, we're, we're getting there, we've we'll got to go through some of this. At the rapture of the church, we all go up to meet the Lord in the air. At the second coming the wicked are taken off the earth. It's the opposite of the rapture. At the rapture of the church, the righteous go up. At the second coming, the wicked are taken off the earth. Remember Jesus said, I'll let the wheat grow with the tares. And at the end of the age, the angels will be the reapers. So at the second coming, uh, uh, the, the wicked are taken off the earth so that the earth can start out with the millennium with all perfect righteousness. So he, he explains this here in a minute. Let's go a little further. Skip down to verse 38. Oh, verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, you can't preach that any harder than right now, isn't that right? Verse 38, For as the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying, and given in marriage until the day that Noah entered in the ark, and knew not till the flood came, took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So think about this. In the midst of seven years of tribulation, people are still wanting life as usual. They're dating. They're, they're marrying. They, they, they want to keep things going as they can. That's with water turning to blood. That's with asteroids hitting the earth. That's with everything you could imagine. One of the first seals or a third of the population gets killed right after the rapture. Come on, Come on like, like two billion people get killed on the earth. And people are still going, we want to get married, we want to date. And people go, what's the economy going to be like? Economy is going to keep going all the way up to the second coming. Because people are, that's what the, how the, the mark of the beast gets, because buying and selling. And you got people wanting to date. If you, ain't, you can't date if you don't have any money. So in the midst of nuclear war, Midst of rivers turning to blood, oceans turning to blood, people are still going, let's go to the movies. <laughs> I mean, it's bizarre. I mean, seriously, with all of that happening, with the Lord trying to get everybody's attention, people want life as usual. So look at the next verse. He gives you the percentage. This is pretty amazing right here. In verse 40, Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. That's not the rapture. That's at the second coming. That's the wicked being taken off the earth. Look at the percentage, 50%. Look at the next verse. Verse 41, Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken and the other left. So he gives you the same percentage as when Jesus was on the cross. You had one thief that got saved, the other thief did not. 50%. But what's amazing is, during the tribulation, half of the population of the earth is going to get saved. That's a pretty good revival. The Bible numbers a 200 million man army that comes against Israel, but it can't number the people that get saved in the trib. The Bible says the number is innumerable. That's a lot of people. So we get a harvest at the end of the church age because we were promised double of what the book of Acts has, but really the biggest harvest is after we leave. Just... I'll say that again. The biggest harvest is after we leave. So think about it. Enoch handed off to Noah. Elijah handed off to Elisha. Jesus handed off to the church. And the church is about to hand off to the Jews. So thank God we're blessed, but really the biggest harvest happens after we leave. And I know you don't hear that on TV. And I know that people don't preach that very much. But we have to use the Bible for end times just like we use the Bible for healing. Come on. It seems when it comes to end time stuff, people just well, don't use the Word. That's what the Word says. I read it to you right there. Half the population. Germany, there's 3% saved. Right now, Norway, a half a percent. France has 1% of 1% saved. So they're going to have a 49% revival. How wonderful for some of those countries that half the population is uh, going to hell. When I'm preaching in Nice or I'll go up into Paris, I preached a lot in Paris. There was a church there I preached at that my mother preached at, I preached at, and my daughter preached at. Three generations. 
You used to, when you go there, they clip your, their nails while you're preaching. They're bored out of their mind. And now you say, let's worship God. You can't get them to stop worshiping. So there's a revival happening because the Lord's coming back. So you go from 1%, you're, 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 you're somewhere in the middle of Paris, and you can look around and go, every single person I see is going to hell. So thank God, at, by the second coming, they've had to have, I mean, what do you call it, a foxhole mentality? you got nuclear weapons happening. People are going, I think I need to get saved. <laughs> like I was preaching in Saskatoon, and I've told you the story before. There was a 96-year-old man there. I gave the altar call. He got saved right there on the front row. I went to him. He'd never been to church his whole life. His wife was with him. His son was with him. And he got born again right there in the service. I went to the airport the next day. Uh, the pastor's sons, Pastor Johnson's sons, took me to lunch. And as we're there at lunch to go to the airport, uh, Pastor Keith thought, hey, you know that guy last night that got saved? He went home to be with the Lord. So he kind of slid in, so you don't want to slide in, amen? <laughs> so, so that's what the tribulation is for, is to put pressure on people that are hard-hearted or stiff-necked or, 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 or not very pliable. They get kind of pliable. Remember, remember people talked about during World War II there were, there were no atheists in foxholes? That's what the tribulation is all about. It looks like judgment, but at least people will get pushed to get saved and not go to hell. And that's what we want. We don't want people going to hell. So let's keep going here. Go to Matthew, uh, Matthew 25. Let's go a little further. Look at verse 31 in Matthew 25 because we're getting close to the millennium. This will just explain what's, what you'll be doing here in a moment. It gives you some information on it. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory. You got, you got verse 31 there? When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He shall sit upon the throne of His glory. Before him shall be gathered all nations, and he'll separate them one from another as the shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And he'll set the sheep on his right hands and the goats on his left. And then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Finally, what happens right here is what all the disciples wanted to happen at Jesus' first coming. They wanted a political Messiah. They want Him to reign over the earth. And right here, that's what's happening. He goes, enter into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Uh, the church age was a mystery, so He didn't tell them that. He just said, I'll be back after two days. Well, here He's coming back after two days. And look what happens. You, you see the sheep and goat judgment. What is that? That's a judgment for people, how they treated his brethren, Israel. And, and so he's going to judge them based on that, whether they get saved or not. The ones that get saved are called sheep nations. The ones that don't are called goats. So he separates the sheep from the goats. The sheep enter into the millennial kingdom and have kids. And that's who you're ruling over for a thousand years. You have to see that those natural people enter into that natural kingdom right there at the second coming. And the Lord says, come, come, come enter into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then, man, it's on like Donkey Kong. It's so cool. A thousand years, man, of, of Jesus reigning. Come on. So let's go look at it. Go to Revelation 19. Look at Revelation 19. We'll get into another verse about this, and then we'll get to the millennium. It just takes a minute to get there because there's so much intro for it. Revelation 19. You know the verses, but we're going to get closer to what it'll be like here in just a moment. Revelation 19. How many glad you came tonight? Amen. How many glad you're here and not in jail? Come on, praise the Lord. All right. Good, 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 good. Better be in church than jail. Here we go. All right, look at Revelation 19. Look down at verse, you know them so well, but let's go to verse 11. And I saw heaven open. This is page 319 if you've got a Bible like mine. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him is called Faithful and True. Wow. In righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as the flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Mm. He's clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are with him in heaven, that's us, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth will go a sharp sword that he'd smite the nations. He'll rule them with a rod of iron. Remember that. So even during the millennium with Lucifer bound, he's going to have to rule them with a rod of iron. So those natural people that make it through the trib will be in natural bodies with Adam's seed in them, and they'll have a tendency to want to rebel. So he's going to have to rule them with a rod of iron, and that shows you who you'll have oversight over, those people. So let's go a little further. He'll rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress and the fierceness, the wrath of Almighty God. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Woo, the boss is coming back right there. So we see the entrance of the king right there. Everything about this book, is he's coming back. For every one verse there is about the first coming, eight times more about the second coming. It's the deal. So how amazing is that all of a sudden we're going to go be raptured, go to the reward seat of Christ, marriage supper of the Lamb, and horse flying school. So, you know, 
I don't, know, I don't think any of you have flown on a horse, but how weird is that going to be? Lean left, trigger, here we go. I, I mean, how bizarre. We're going to get on horses and be airborne coming back down to the earth, and what a view we're going to have. It's going to be so cool. So let's go to Revelation 20, and let's get into the start of this. It's going to be cool. We'll get into the millennium now. Look at Revelation 20, and watch what happens in verse 1. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. Notice this, one angel is going to bind the devil. Not a team of angels, not a whole group of angels, one. One angel is going to bind him. He laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil, Satan, and bound him a thousand years, cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. Then after that he must be loose for a little season. So we see the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. Lucifer is put in this pit. I'm going to get permission to go by and play a little violin for him, sing some of my greatest hit songs. How you doing there, pit dweller? I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to mock him. I'm going to try to mess with him. If, I, if the Lord will let me do it, I'm going, to, I'm going to torment that guy as much as I possibly can. So he gets put in the pit for a thousand years. Wonderful. So the millennium starts off with perfect righteousness. You know how people like uh, NCIS or whatever, what's the show, Law and Order? We want perfect righteousness. Jesus will institute flawless perfect righteousness on the earth for a thousand years. You'll have Jesus on TV, he'll be on Fox, he'll be on NBC, he'll be on CNN, he'll be MSNBC, it'll be Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the afternoon. The movies will be about Peter and John going up to the temple of the gate called Beautiful. I mean, you'll have movies about everything in the Bible. It'll be Jesus everywhere and it's going to be the coolest time ever. It's going to be a very natural time. The curse will be lifted off the earth. Longevity is restored so people live to be a thousand years old. But without the curse, you have babies being born. There's no more, no more deformed babies, no more sickness, no more disease. Awesome. Come on. The Prince of Peace reigning from Jerusalem. Yeah. Out of Jerusalem will go that voice that will reign over all the earth. Hallelujah. And man, what preparation we're making for it right now to be with Him that thousand years. Wonderful, wonderful. So let's go look at some more. You got your Bibles there? Go, go over to Isaiah. Let's look at how, what it's going to be like. Because we just don't hear a lot of preaching on this. So I want to go through some of it, and then we're going to get to your function, and that's when it gets really crazy. So just hang with me a little bit. There's a lot to get into. And I know it's a lot of verses, but it kind of preaches for you how clear it is. Because nothing's better than the Word. Come on, amen. So grab your Bibles there and go to uh, Isaiah. And go back to Isaiah chapter 11. And we'll see how things are changed the moment Jesus comes back to the earth. Let's look at nature here in Isaiah 11, and uh, we'll get into it. Look at Isaiah chapter 11. Skip down to verse number 4. It's page 785. You've got a Bible like, uh, Bible like mine. Here we go. Isaiah 11, verse 4. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and reprove with equity the meek of the earth. And he'll smite the earth, watch this, with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he'll slay the wicked. So you... <laughs> You get into this man and you, you put all the things together. He's going to come back to a couple of places there at the second coming. This describes uh, uh, what's going to happen there at the second coming with the rod of his mouth. He'll slay the wicked. It's just amazing. He'll go to Petra. He'll go to the Mount of Olives. And then he's going to walk through the Valley of Megiddo. And the Bible says the blood's going to be as high as, high as the horse's bridle. Wow. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. Man, the boss is coming back. Hallelujah. Amen. So watch what happens here. It says in, uh, in verse 5, Righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. We've said it before. You're going to go to the park, and you're going to see a kid with a lion on a leash. I know it's going to freak us out, because it's going to take some time to get used to that, because you're like, uh, these kids are playing with lions. This is crazy. So, so even beasts are tamed. See, that's why it's called the mark of the beast. Lucifer feels no remorse. Just like if a beast ate, ate a, another animal or something, they don't feel remorse, they're beasts. So, so, so beasts are going to be tamed when the Prince of Peace comes back. Hallelujah. Nature's altered. Watch what happens. It says in the cow, in verse 7, the cow and the, uh, they'll feed, the cow they'll feed, their young ones will lie down together, and they'll eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of an ass. The winged child shall put his hand on the cock triced in. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So the moment the king comes, nature's even altered. So let's go over to Isaiah chapter 30. Let's look a little bit more about nature. So cool. Man, what's amazing is 
This is something that we're not preaching about two or three hundred years from now. This is like we're at this. We're, we're, right, we're right there. That's why I have so many things that I like to preach on, and you don't even get to preach on them because the Lord's like, you've got to get into this because we're that close. There's an absolute unction for us to be in position because He's about to come back. So look at Isaiah. Look there at that, chapter 30. This is so cool. Isaiah chapter 30, look at verse 26. Isaiah 30, verse 26. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days. And the day the Lord binds up the breach of His people and heals the stroke of their wounds. So here you see that nighttime is going to be like our day right now. Daytime will be seven times brighter. So how cool is that going to be? It's never going to get dark, ever. I've told you before what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to, Pastor Chris and I are going to go play golf at St. Andrews over in Scotland. We're going to be translated to Augusta and play golf. We're going to be translated to Pebble Beach and play golf. Translated to Hawaii and play golf. Come right back around to St. Andrews. We might play 24 hours a day, all day and all night, because we won't get tired and it'll never get dark. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, how cool is that going to be? And some people go, you, you're really going to want to play golf? Now, we're going to have duties, but that thousand years is really a thousand years of, of, of Sabbath. You're off. Well, that went over real good. Even <laughs> it, 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 it don't know off for that, right? But I mean, how many of you, you know, I, I love playing football. I was kind of a football freak as a kid. And you go to football practice, but then you came home from football practice and you played football in the, in the neighborhood after football practice. And then when it got dark, you went over to the street light and played kill the man with the ball under the street light. Your mother had to go out there and yell at you. You'd have played all night. But we would have, we would have played more if we had light. So this is going to be a wonderful time. Photosynthesis has changed because you've got that much brightness. And if you look at it, it looks like it'll be just like it was before the flood. Hallelujah. So I might have to do some yelling here in a minute. Come on. <laughs> Amen. Absolutely. So it's a wonderful season coming. Now hang with me just a little bit because there are things we'll, we'll get into. It'll be very natural. There's going to be roller coasters. I mean, I remember I was in Nebraska and the Lord said, tell them they've never seen a roller coaster until they see one in the millennium. And it got kind of quiet like roller coasters. Yes. The Lord loves you having fun. I mean, the, the guy on the roller coaster is going to go, do you want to go faster? Absolutely. I'm in a glorified body. Come on, crank it up a notch. And I mean, we're, it'll, it'll be very natural, but you're going to have oversight. The Bible, Paul said, why would you take things to court when you're going to judge angels? The word judge, there's the word rule, like God raised up judges in the Old Testament. The Bible says that if you're faithful over so much, you'll rule over ten cities or you'll rule over two cities. So you're going to be ruling over regions. Just like right now, you know, when Jesus uh, came, the, the madman Kudera came out, and the demons begged him not to cast him away into another region. They wanted to stay in that area. Even the point said, send us into the swine so we don't have to leave this region. So you, you'll be regional at that time, but yet you'll be able to travel at the speed of thought. So distance is going to have a whole different thought pattern for you. Like, like also in the Holy Ghost, I'll go, Pastor Chris, meet me at St. Andrews in 10 seconds. <laughs> and he'll, he'll go, let me look at my calendar. Let's go. Boom. We're there. Hallelujah. Won't that be cool? Glorified bodies, natural people that you're having oversight over, and you, you will, you'll be ministering to people. Now hang with me. Remember the Bible talks about Lucifer's rulership right now. We, right now in this present age, we have principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, wicked spirits in heavenly places. So all Lucifer does right now, it's a, a type of what we'll have during the millennium. He stole it from the Lord. So just like the, the, he, he has rulers over, over places, you're going to be rulers over places as well. Yep. It's going to be cool that you'll have, a, you'll have a tender heart for those natural people that make mistakes because you knew what it was like making mistakes yourself. Really good, so you'll, you'll judge with mercy and with kindness. Because, man, whether you're ready for it or not, there's a lot for us to do that whole time. But it'll be very joyful, absolutely joyful. And, you know, you, I used to think, you know, the Lord's going to come back like bewitched, you know, twinkle his nose and everything's just going to change. No, he's going to come back to Jerusalem. He's going to let man rebuild the earth. He's into that because you take pride in what you do. So while natural man is rebuilding all the beginning of the millennial reign, you're going to have functions that are going to be so cool. And we'll get to them here in just a minute. Let's go look a little bit more. So let's go look at church. You want to see what church is going to be like? Yeah. You say, was there church during the millennium? Absolutely. Let's go look. Go to Zechariah. Now, it's easy to find because you can go to Malachi and go backwards. Because we, we all go there for tithing. So go to Malachi and go backwards to Zechariah. Easy to find. Everybody, everybody glad they came tonight? You with me okay? Look at Zechariah, and we'll go to Zechariah 14, and we'll look at church for a minute. Zechariah 14, skip down to verse 16. This is just amazing right here. Zechariah 14, verse 16. 
And he says here in verse 16, I'll give you a couple minutes so I can hear pages going, that's all right. You don't normally go to Zechariah very often. But you need to read Zechariah 13 as well. You ought to have homework tonight. It's so good. It's, it's amazing. But Zechariah 14 is super detailed about the second coming. So watch how he, he words this here in verse 16. And it shall come to pass that of everyone that is left of all the nations which came up against Jerusalem, talking about those people that make it through the latter part of the trib and enter into the millennial reign of Christ, they shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whosoever will not go up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up, they'll come not, they'll have no rain. Watch this. There shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So you're going to have Jesus saying, I'll, I want you to come to church once a year, and heathen will go, I ain't going. So see, what you're going to be dealing with, you've got a thousand years of dealing with some of that thought pattern. Could you imagine Jesus is physically ruling and people going, I don't like him, he's too bright. He glows too much, don't like his beard. I mean, I, I don't get it. How do, you, how do you say I'm not coming to church? What's amazing is like right now, how many of you know we come Wednesday night, we come Sunday morning or whatever, but you, in this time of the earth, you need to force feed yourself more word. Like today, I listened to Brother Hagen, Believer's Authority. The day before that, I listened to uh, Right and Wrong Thinking. And I listened to well, What to Do When Victory Seems Lost and Faith Seems Weak. I'm hammering the word on the inside of me because of the climate that I live in of darkness. I've got to continually put light in me. But here, they go get with Jesus once a year and it sustains them for the entire year. Woo. His words are spirit, and they are life. They go hear a little chat from the Lord, and man, it infuses them for the entire year. But the heathen go, I'm not going up there. You ain't going to make me. And the Lord goes, hey, no problem. If you don't come, you don't get any rain. If you don't get any rain, you don't get any crops. You don't get any crops, you don't get any food. So it's kind of bizarre. But who doesn't want to go hear the Lord? I've been in several meetings where Jesus physically came into the meeting. And let me just tell you, I've never felt anything like that in all my life. I mean, one time he came through the door of the Holiday Inn in, in California. Ed Dufresne was right there. Buddy Harrison was right there. And Jesus walks right up to Ed. I saw Jesus and I'm freaking out. Oh, my God. Literally, oh, my God. <laughs> and I'm just telling you, man, it, it's just being in, in the Lord's presence, he's appeared to me a couple times, uh, several times. And each time, I, one time I cried for probably 10 hours because I couldn't handle how good he is. I'm telling you, we, he's just so good. His mercy endures forever. And can you imagine physically being able to see him and have access to him and go, he ain't going. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> You're not going to go see the king? So that's church once a year. But think of those words that he says that will bear the people up for an entire year with the presence of God in them. Hallelujah. So there'll be a lot of things that are like that that are cool. But let's go look a little bit more. Go back over to Isaiah and let's look at a couple more things before we get to our function. Because we're going to get to our function here in a second. And it's so cool. You got your Bibles there? Look at Isaiah. Go over to Isaiah uh, chapter 60. Or you just pick out the chapter. We'll see if you're flowing. Come on. Go to Isaiah 60. Look at verse 21. We'll look a little bit more about the millennium. We're getting closer to our function because, man, when we get into our function, it just gets cooler and cooler. We'll get there. It just takes a minute. Isaiah 60, verse 21. Thy people also shall all be righteous. They'll inherit the land forever the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that, that I may be glorified. Watch this. A little one shall become a thousand, a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in my time. I mean, think about how things will grow with Jesus living there and Lucifer bound. Just the earth's going to flourish with life everywhere. Hallelujah. Go a little further here. Look at chapter 61. I know it's a lot of verses, but we're getting closer. So chapter 61. Look, look at verse 4. They'll build up the waste places, they'll raise up the former desolations, and they'll repair the waste cities and the desolations of many generations. So, I mean, the devastation that happens during the tribulation, he's going to let man rebuild everything and, and build the earth back. I mean, it's just a, a, a wonderful thing that's going to be happening. I believe Paul's going to have a show in the afternoons, you know, like instead of Dr. Oz or, 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 or uh, what's the other lady that has a show? What's her name? Uh, Oprah or what's the other one now? Uh, God. Ellen. Instead of Dr. Oz or Ellen, you'll have Paul have his own show. Uh, he'll interview, have Pastor Chris and Debbie on, and Paul will go, hey, what was it like pastoring right before the coming of the Lord? And you guys will go, well, we use your letters to receive strength. And all of a sudden, you, all of a sudden the, the, the studio will be filled with angels going, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. 
you'll see that exact kind of stuff with, on TV and everywhere. The knowledge of the Lord's going all over the place. It's going to be so cool. So let's spend a couple minutes getting into our function. Okay, we've been learning so many years about who we are in Christ. Been learning the move of the Spirit. The Bible says that we're longing to be clothed upon with our clothes which are from heaven. But Romans chapter 8 talks about don't wait till you get your glorified body to start cooperating with God. That's what Romans chapter 8 is all about, how to be led by your spirit. And then it finishes up Romans chapter 8 about, hey, you're about to change, you're about to be altered into His image. So, so how much more will it be easy to, to cooperate with Him in a glorified body? How much more learning now how, how far ahead of the curve you'll be? So this is what's going to happen. Go over to Isaiah 65, run over there. Getting close to your function, almost, almost there, close to your function. Isaiah 65, look down at verse 20. He's going to say a lot in this verse, but it's so cool. Isaiah 65, verse 20, because we're getting close to our, our jobs. We'll be, we'll be there in just a moment. Isaiah 65, verse 20, Then shall there be no more thence an infant of days, or an old man hath not fulfilled his days. For a child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. Man, there's a lot in that verse, and we'll come back to it. They'll, inhabit ho- they'll, they'll build houses and they'll inhabit them. They'll plant vineyards and they'll eat the fruit of them. So it'll be a very natural thousand years. But he said something there in that verse before that, that for someone that dies as a child, if he's a sinner, uh, he's going to be accursed and go to hell. Yeah. Indicating if you're a natural-bodied saint, you won't be subject to death. Now, we're never going to be subject to death. We'll be in glorified bodies. But a natural-bodied saint won't be subject to death, and I'll show you why. What will happen is during the millennium, let's say you have a natural-bodied saint come into your building here, and he, one of your lights are out, and he puts a tall ladder over there, and that natural-bodied saint, this is not you and I. We're in the church age. We're in glorified bodies. This is a natural-bodied saint in the millennium, okay? And he, he climbs up that ladder, and he goes to mess with that light, and he slips and falls and breaks his neck right there, hits the ground. Well, you've already seen it in a vision. That's called a word of wisdom. You walk right through the wall and you walk over to him and go, it's a good thing you live in the millennial reign of Christ. Rise, take up your bed and walk. You raise him up because it's in you to raise people up. That's why people are frustrated right now is because you know you're supposed to be doing that more. You're going to have an entire thousand years of not just tasting of the powers of the world to come, operating in the powers of the world to come. It's going to be crazy. You'll see a guy, let's, see, let's say you see a guy on a motorcycle. He's a natural body saint, not a glorified one. He hits one of those jumps on his bike, you know, and he flips over. I was watching them the other day. They're crazy how they do that. Maybe he doesn't do it just right. He's just trying to learn. And he, he's a natural body saint. He flips over, cracks his back, and you show up. You're translated right there. You've already seen it in a vision. That's a word of wisdom. You walk over to him, say, rise, take up your bed and walk. Good thing you live right now, buddy, and they're instantly made whole. Because it won't be disease, but you'll still have natural people do stupid stuff. You say, well, natural people do stupid stuff? Natural people don't even go to church. That's how stupid they are. Come on. So you you think everything's going to be cool, but but natural people just are weird sometimes. Hang with me. So you're going to have a group of people that still have that tendency to rebel. So God's so cool, He gave that group of people a thousand years to choose Him, even without a tempter, and people still don't choose the Lord. Every dispensation ends in the failure of man. And you've got a thousand years with Jesus physically in their face, and people go, I don't, I don't want Him. You'll be telling people, look, there He is right there. You need to ask Him into your heart. So right. How in the world do you reject the Lord in a perfect society? I, I, it blows my mind. Without Lucifer there to even tempt them. Right. So let's go through some of this real quick. Let's run through it. And, uh, hey, I'll give you a couple to show you how we're tasting. I, I've told you the stories before, but I'll, I'll give you a couple new ones. We'll see. I was preaching out in California years ago, and I took my daughter with me, her senior year of high school. And we went to this church, and as we walked in, I had a vision. I saw this guy in the church that looked just like Robert Redford. He had his hands around the pastor's throat upside down like this, like he thought he was over the pastor. So I told Lauren, my daughter, this was her senior year in high school, I said, Lauren, there's a guy in the church, he looks just like Robert Redford, but he thinks he's over the pastor, and he's choking the pastor. He has his hands, it's weird how I saw it, but I saw his hands upside down like this, like he's over him. And, uh, and Lauren goes, man, Dad, that's weird. Well, you know, the pastor came in, as a friend of mine, he walked in and I said, hey, how you doing, buddy? He goes, good. I said, hey, there's a guy in your church, he looks just like Robert Redford. And I saw his hands around your throat, uh, uh, putting pressure on you, like trying to control you. And that pastor friend of mine said, that's right. He said, we're getting ready to start another church. And that guy in my church, he looks just like Robert Redford. He told me, I'm not going to allow you to start that church. 
Now, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? Because <laughs> normally you want to help a pastor start more churches and not stop churches, amen? I think he just was fearful and thought he might lose his pastor. So as bizarre as that is, that buddy of mine opened the collar of his shirt and showed me the rash on his throat because he was under so much pressure from that guy in his church trying to control him. I thought, that's the craziest thing in the world. So Lauren and I walked through the side door, kind of where the green room was, came through the side door over there, came walking down. I saw the guys. I walked in. I said, look, Lauren, there's the guy. He looks just like Robert Redford. So I got up and preached, he who looks like Robert Redford. No, I didn't say that. Come on. <laughs> no, I got up and preached about the plan and purpose of God for that pastor's life, and you can't control that. You can enjoy it. It's an apostle's mentality to build and to plant. You can jump in on that, and it'll get on you. You start building stuff yourself because you can pick up on that anointing. Don't try to stifle it. Jump in and enjoy it. And the Holy Ghost fell in that meeting to show the plan and the purpose of God for that pastor's life. That's not the power of the world to come. That's tasting. So see how tasting can change the course of a whole church. They started that next church. It grew bigger than the other church. But here that guy was trying to constrain the pastor and the Holy Ghost through, through the power of the world to come uh, manifests what the, the will of God is for that pastor's life. I'll give you another one. Ready for another one? You ever been to Yuma, Arizona? How many have been to Yuma? Man, thank God we're not in Yuma tonight. I mean, amen, come on. Uh, uh, anyway, I don't, think, I don't know if the Lord even knows where Yumi is, but anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's out there. So, uh, no, He knows. <laughs> so I, I was traveling with this prophet years ago, and we were there in Yuma, and he preached for a little bit, and at the end of the service, we're going to go to Denny's and get a Grand Slam. So I'm going back to the book table to mess with the book table and, and uh, do that stuff. You know. As I walked back toward the book table, I had a vision. Here comes a word of wisdom. I saw the pastor in that church in an airplane called a push-pull. One engine's going this way, one engine's going that way. And that plane was in a dive in this vision. Remember how in the Old Testament, Elisha said, Went not my heart with you when you joined yourself to the chariot? I'm sitting in the cockpit of that plane watching that pilot pull back on the yoke of that plane. Papers are flying everywhere. They're panicking. The pilot's panicking. And the pastor's in that plane with him. So I'm thinking, oh, dear Lord, I've got to say something to this pastor. So I'm walking back to the book table getting ready to go to Denny's. We go to Denny's, and I get a Grand Slam. I get the pancakes, the bacon, and the sausage. You know how good that is. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so I'm sitting there with the guy I work for, and I'm thinking, how do I say this? Because I don't know, really know when the intro could be, because I'm, I'm just there to help him and, and to you know, keep my mouth shut, basically. Well, uh, all of a sudden, the pastor goes, we're sitting there talking. He goes, hey, I'm going flying tomorrow. And then my ears perked up. He goes, I'm going on what's called a push-pull airplane. I was like, oh, my God. So I'm sitting there going, man, i got to say something to this pastor. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm freaking out, like, what, you know, what do I do? So time went on long, and I knew it was getting close to the meal being over. And I said, hey, pastor, i got to say something. I said, I don't want you to freak out, but before we came over here, I saw you in a vision. I, I saw you in a push-pull airplane. I'll tell you what your pilot looks like. He's got bald hair, got gold rim glasses, real circle like that. He said, yeah, that's my pilot. I said, he was yoke, pulling back on the yoke of that plane. Papers are flying everywhere. You were in a dive. He goes, wow. I said, don't be afraid. I just check out your man before I go flying. I flew, uh, the guy I worked for, we flew back to Tulsa, and uh, that pastor called me when I got back. He said, hey, I went to the airport and checked out that guy, had, the, uh, had him check him out. He had lied. He would said he had all these checkout rides in a push-pull, had never been in a push-pull. So I believe the Lord saved the guy's life. That's not the power of the world to come. That's tasting the power of the world to come. So right now, see, we're learning all this stuff because we're not done let me just say that. It's July of 2021. If we're raptured the next couple of years, you instantly have a wonderful time with the Lord, and then you come back and start operating like we're supposed to be operating like now, but in a measure that's so radical, we're, we're just freaked out. Right. I'll, I'll give you a couple more here, and we'll close. I'm closing right now. Go to, go to Revelation 20. Go over there, and we'll, we'll dismiss here in just a minute or two. Come on. I want to make sure we don't miss a miracle. Now think about that. The Bible says that His voice is like thunder. Think of being at the throne of God and hearing the Lord speak to us. Right. Woo, hallelujah. Mm. Revelation 20. Let me give you two more real quick and we'll get to Revelation 20. Uh, I've told these stories before many times. I've got tons of others, but these just I like the best. I could tell you stories about words of wisdom all night long. It would freak you out. Just Lord, the Lord will show you something that's going to happen before it happens. Mind-boggling. Right. But one time I was in Oakland, Iowa. There's a church out there in a cornfield. Michael Calstrip's the pastor's name. And I had taught his sons how to use their handbrakes and teach them to do 180s. You know what I'm saying? But I taught, I taught them that in the snow, okay? Snow and ice. I said, now take your handbrake, hit that, hit that handbrake, lift it and do 180s. And man, they loved it. But as in the snow, they started doing it on dry pavement and ruined the wheels of their car. So every time I preached there, the pastor goes, uh, Joe taught my boys how to do 180s, and they ruined the hubs of their wheels. So that's how he introduces me. They're just real normal people, you know what I mean? 
So one of the times I was going there, I was preaching, and uh, uh, had morning and night meetings for a camp meeting. On my way to the meeting in the morning, and I was on my way there, and all of a sudden as I'm driving toward the meeting, I have a vision. I see that pastor, Michael, my, Pastor Michael Calstrom. He's a tall guy. He's in a Cessna 210-like plane, and I see him land on this runway, and I saw this young pastor come up to him, and he walked out with this outline. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you not make some of the same mistakes I may have made. Next thing you know, I see Mike take that plane off and land somewhere else. I saw the cracks on the runway where someone repaired the asphalt, you know, you know how you fix stuff. A different pastor came walking up. He climbed out of the plane. He took this outline. He said, I'm going to help you not make some of the same mistakes I may have made. Next thing you know, man, I'm back in my car. Thank you, Jesus, I hadn't run to the building. Because, you know, people sometimes get tunnel vision going out there through the cornfields and hit the building. And they have rumble strips set up. So I thought, man, I've been, I've been watching this guy fly. I hope I don't hit the building. So I woke up. Here we go. I'm, you know, not asleep, but I don't even know how to explain that. Because I was right there watching him show those pastors what to do. So I got in and preached a little bit that morning. You know, did a little bit of Elvis. I don't do much Elvis anymore. We did a little bit of Elvis and uh, preached a little bit. And uh, I said, hey, Pastor Mike, if this means something to you, wonderful. I said, if it doesn't, forget it. I could miss it by a mile. Because when, when God gives someone something, if it doesn't confirm something that's already in their heart, just forget about it. Put it on a shelf. Yeah. So I said, I, I said, I could miss it by a mile. But I said, well, you know what? You're going to have your own airplane. You're going to use it like a car. You'll go around to all these pastors around here, and you'll help them might not make some of the same mistakes that you may have made. He smiled. He got up from the platform after I said that. I said a few more things, but he got up on the platform. He said, you know, what did I say last week? He said, I'm going to have my own airplane. I'm going to use it like a car. I'm going to go around all these states and help these young pastors. Oh. And what's God trying to do? He's trying to emphasize the plan and the purpose of God for his life. Because when he got up and said, I'm going to have my own airplane, you can just tell, tell people, go, well, what's he need an airplane for? Let me tell you what he need an airplane yeah. for. Because you can feel that. Well, who does he think he is? Rama contacted him right after that, asked him to be a regional director. He took that plane in Iowa, went up into North Dakota, went up into Minnesota, used it like a car, just like the Holy Ghost said. Sent me a picture of the plane. He'd been taking flying lessons. Cessna 210, put it on my refrigerator. So see, that's tasting. That's not the power of the world to come. That's tasting. Think of how expressive your life is going to be operating at the full potential of the glory of the Lord in your life. Man, there's just wonderful things ahead. That's why we're getting into all this, is to give you a preview. Let me give you one more. I've told you this one before, but uh, hang with me. Uh, don't get too bored. We're closing in a second. We're going to beat the storm. Hallelujah. We already, we already have. Come on. I remember I've told you a story where Colleen and I were living out in California for a while. We were traveling out of a church. We went there just to help the pastor, really, even though I was on the road all the time. Uh, I wanted to help the pastor and his wife just to be a strength for him. The week I got there, uh, someone on his staff walked up to him and said, Oh, good Lord. He just went, he just went crazy, he tried to take over the church. This is what he told me. He said, the strength, this is what he told me. He said, the strength that you feel when you come into our church, it's me. I said, actually, I, said, actually, I think it's Jesus. <laughs> Can you imagine thinking that, much less saying that? So that's why I moved there. So I found out the first week, hello, this is why I'm here. This guy went nuts. <laughs> so, uh, so I was coming back to Tulsa. Colleen and I came back to Winter Bible, and we got there, and that one of the nights of Winter Bible, we were going to a birthday party for my, my nephew, Zach. John and Michelle Grinwald's son. So we went to this house, and there was a circle drive. So Colleen and, and my daughter Lauren were in the van. I was in a minivan. And we went through the circle drive, and there were cars all in front of me, so I couldn't go anywhere, so I'm going to have to back up. So I told Colleen and Lauren, I said, you guys get out right there and go in that door over there. There were a couple of doors. So I looked back behind me over here because I'm backing that van up, and all of a sudden I heard someone scream. I ran over Colleen. My wife saw some kinfolk in the window and stood right there. Well, that front tire of that van ran over her. She fell on the ground and was screaming bloody murder. Cats and dogs, I got out of the van, came over there, cats and dogs came running up, kids came running up. My wife is laying on the ground screaming. My daughter's standing there looking at Colleen. I walked over to Colleen. I said, I command your leg and your ankle to be healed right now in the name of Jesus. And I said, get up. And she looked at me like, have you lost your mind? I said, get up. And I grabbed her like this by the hands. The power of God went up and down her body. She said, oh my God, that's the power of God. Like a heater, went, went from the top of her head all the way down to the soles of her feet. Went up and down just like that. She goes, my God, this is real. And I'm standing there going, I just ran over my wife. That's not the power of the world to come. That's tasting. She instantly healed. We went into the party. My sister Michelle goes, how you doing? I went, nah, 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 nah. I'm doing good. I couldn't even talk, man. I just ran over Colleen. She goes, how you doing? I'm doing good. You know what? We went into the party. She never had any pain. I flew the next day to Daytona, Florida to preach. Colleen flew back to California. Never any pain at all. That's tasting. What's going to be like when we're uh, uh, having a fulfillment of all that? That's why we have to get this now. And in the ages to come, 
He'll show forth His goodness and His kindness to those that first trusted in Him. We trusted in Him when we couldn't see Him. They'll be able to see Him. Let's close right now. Man, I've preached too long, guys. Come on, right now, closing right now. Dear God, I never preached this long. Here we go, Revelation 20. Look at verse, you pick out a verse, you'll see if you're flowing. Man, Revelation 20. Dear Lord, I look down, it's 820. Help me, Jesus. All right, verse 7. When the thousand years are expired, this is the coolest part, watch this. Revelation 20, this is unbelievable, really. Verse 7. When the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison. He'll go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and encompassed the camp of the saints about, the beloved city, Jerusalem. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, Lucifer is led out of the pit to gather all the rebels. They instantly go to Jerusalem trying to kill the saints. If you read it, they encompass the camp of the saints. and In the Greek, it means they're airborne over the city and fire comes down out of heaven. That's the last rebellion right there. Right after that, you have the great white throne judgment. This is at the end of the millennium. Millennium's done right there. You have the great white throne judgment, and then God renovates the earth, and then He gets a U-Haul and brings heaven down to earth. Amen. I mean, you talk about a move. That's a pretty big move to move your planet down to this planet. He's going to move planet heaven in the new Jerusalem right down here to the earth. Natural people will go back and forth into the new Jerusalem. They'll traffic back and forth, taking their glory and their honor to the Father and the Son right there. And the natural people will eat of the tree of life, Along the river, just like Adam and Eve could have eaten of it and lived forever in that horrible state. These natural people will eat of the tree of life uh, once a month. You won't have to eat of the tree of life. He that hath the Son hath life. You're a whole different group of people than those natural people. Now listen to this. For eternity, you'll be a glorified group reigning over natural people forever. There'll be a natural race, just like Adam and Eve were natural. God didn't change His mind. He just got interrupted. So you're going to be a different species than those natural people for eternity. And He's going to show off the church. This, I like to say this, and I'm shutting up. During the millennium, the Lord's going to go look at, you know, people will be whining, natural body people will be whining about something. The Lord will go, what are you whining about? My church had Lucifer to deal with. He was on the earth with them at the same time, and they didn't whine. He's going to, she's going to show off the church. Let's thank Him for a minute, and then we'll go, Father, we thank You. We thank you, we thank you, we love you. We're amazed at your plans, your purposes, that you're preparing us for eternity, preparing us for the next step after we're caught up. Lord, we, we want to do your bidding before we leave, but yet we get a glimpse of, of what this millennial reign of Christ will be like, where Jesus, you are glorified. Jesus, you are magnified. Jesus, you are lifted up. We're so amazed at your mercy and your kindness. We give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We honor you, Jesus. We honor you, Jesus. You know, I had a couple things come to me, and then we'll, 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 we'll head out. Someone, I saw you almost like coughing up blood uh, uh, to the point you were coughing so harsh that there was blood coming up. You're healed right now in Jesus' name. This other one is the interior of your ear. I don't know what it is, but some, some, uh, I don't know if it's the bones or the nerves or whatever, but it's the interior of your ears being healed. You know, I don't know if you have a trouble with balance, but I don't think it's that. I think it's something else. The interior part of your ear is being restored. Oh, thank you, Lord. This other one is pretty common, but your ribs. You've got some kind of damage in your ribs. Your ribs are being healed. Amen. Just take it. Praise God. Hallelujah. And this is common, but I'm going to do it. Uh, 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 the base of your spine is being healed. Just take it. The base of your spine. Yeah, hallelujah. Praise God. Isn't the Lord good? Yeah. His mercy endures forever, doesn't it? Somebody, you got some kind of damage on the lining of your upper eye, eyelid. You got some kind of damage on that upper part. You're being healed right now. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for being patient for just a moment. I know I preached longer than I meant to. I just don't want to miss a miracle. I don't want to leave and the Lord get on to me and go, now you, you didn't call that out. Because we'll, we'll go home. We're about to see Jesus face to face. So there's nothing more important than being in church. It really is. They're just... What can compare with being where we can worship and honor Him together? Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Cartilage in your knee being restored. Cartilage. Cartilage in your knee. Just take it. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God.